Today, we're in um, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1 through 13. Wow, we made it. I don't know if we made it, but we're here. Someone named the uh, Romans 8 the chapter of all chapters. Why did they do that? Because if you've been journeying with us through Romans, you'll understand that as we started out in chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and all the way up, there's been uh, times where it's been challenging. The truth that God has brought out has been tough. It's different from the way we think or the way we think of ourselves or think about others in the world in which we live in, and there's kind of been ebbs and flows. But now we get to chapter 8, and uh, chapter 8 is an amazing chapter. And one of the things I want to point out, just uh, getting started before we get into verse 1, is the first verse and the last verse of chapter 8, why it's called the chapter of all chapters. Because verse 1 starts out and says, there is no condemnation. And we're going to walk into some understanding of what that means. But the last verse in chapter says, there is no separation. Wow. No condemnation, no separation. So it's got to be filled with amazing things in between. And it is. It even teaches us how to live as sons and daughters, not just servants or slaves. Not that we don't serve, but uh, with that uh, mentality. So let's dive in this morning and look at um, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, where Paul is coming out of Romans chapter 7. And as he's coming out of Romans chapter 7, this was a a challenging chapter in a sense that it uh, highlighted all of our weaknesses and and, uh, all of our struggles apart from Christ. And Paul gets to the end of chapter 7 and he says, who will rescue me? from this wretched person that I am. And then he states the answer, thanks be to Jesus Christ who delivered me and rescued me. And he comes out of that, that, that statement, that declaration, that reality, that truth into chapter 8 verse 1. And he says, therefore, because Christ has rescued us from the wretched person that we are, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now most of us, and I probably would be included in that camp, when I would hear this verse, this verse quoted, I would think, I'm under no condemnation until I mess up again. Until I do something shameful again. Until I disappoint God again. And then the condemnation comes back on me. That's how I lived for a long period of time. But that is not what this verse says. This verse says, and I'm going to just add a couple of words for emphasis. This verse says, therefore, there is no, not one condemnation left for you in Christ Jesus. There is not one condemnation left that you can be condemned by from God upon you because of your life in Christ Jesus. Now that's very different and that's an adjustment to live to, to think that because I'm in Christ, I will never ever be condemned again by Him. Now, what Paul is not saying is that there will never be failures or there will never be mistakes or there will never be consequences. He's not saying that. He's saying there is no condemnation the times that we mess up or the mistakes that we make or the consequences that we come under because of something that we've done. Those are not necessarily automatically removed or even prevented from us walking into. But he says from his side, from the legal point of view, there is not one condemnation left that can be levied in Christ Jesus. That's amazing to grasp the full measure of what he is saying. John three seventeen and 18, Jesus kind of reinforces this. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed 
in the name of God's one and only Son. And then later in John 5, 24, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Now, Jesus is saying the same thing here as Paul, is that there's not a condemnation that is remaining for us in Christ Jesus. So now let's look at verses 2, 3, and 4 and see a little bit of understanding as to why there's no condemnation. The first is, here is how that we are not condemned. Verse 2 says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I, I want to kind of look at one word here out of this verse, and the word is law. Lots of times when we hear the word law, we think of something that's written down. Like, for instance, the Ten Commandments. It's very clear, do's and don'ts. It's written down. And then Leviticus expounded upon that, things we shouldn't do and shouldn't do as we live together. And then the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wrote commands to us that we should do and not do and what we should do. And so when we hear the word law, oftentimes we gravitate towards something that's written down, do's and don'ts. But there's another way to interpret the word law, and that is it is a force, a power, or a capability that we hadn't had before. And so in this case, we're really talking about that understanding of law. That the spirit of the that the law of the spirit is actually a force, it's a capability, it's a power that is gifted and given to you that you didn't have access to before because you weren't in Christ. And then since you weren't in Christ, you were subject to the law, not written, but a power and a force and an incapability that took you away from God. It's like the law of gravity. It's not written in our constitution. It's not even in the Sermon on the Mount. But does it work? We all know what gravity is. If I would step off this stage, I would go down. It's a force. It's a power. It's a, a, a again, it's something that, that we all understand that it works, and yet it's not written, so to speak, in, in, a, in a constitution. We just know it just, it just comes forth. And so Paul is talking about the law of the Spirit, and he's really meaning to say it's not like a written code, but it's really a force and a power that's at work in our lives as a result of knowing Christ. And so as we begin to understand the context of how this is written, then it helps to clear things up. That the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death really are referring to a force and a power and a capability, not something written down. So in verse 3, then we move on. It says, here's why there is no condemnation. It says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. I want to go back and pull out one word from verse 2 here to bring it forward in verse 3, and that's the word through. If you go back in verse 2, you'll notice it says, through Jesus Christ. And that applies in verse 3. It's through Jesus Christ that we are then able to receive the law of the Spirit and walk into it. It's what he did on the cross. It's through Christ. When Jesus was born into this world, he was not born with a corrupt human nature. He was born of woman, Mary, and he was born of God the Father. He was born of spirit. Therefore, he did not come into this world with a corrupt human nature as we did from in the inheritance we received from Adam. And so therefore, he kept that all the way through his life. He lived a sinless life in something you and I did not do, but he had a purpose for why he lived this sinless life. It wasn't to get into the Guinness Book of World's Record of the first one that lived life without sin. That was not his purpose. His purpose was that he would actually take that which crippled us and nail it to the cross, make it dead, 
so that we could live a victorious life and have free access to God. What an amazing thing that Jesus did when he went to the cross and came and said, now, I'm going to the cross on your behalf as a substitute, and if you believe that what I've done counts for you today, then you will have no condemnation in your life for the rest of your life. What an amazing, simple way for us to be in relationship with God. And in fact, many complain that it's too simple. It's like it's not educated enough, but that's why God did it. See, the gospel is not for the educated and the uneducated and the rich and the poor and, and the slave and the free and the, and the ethnic groups that we have. It's not for one or the other. It's not for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. It's for the whole world. Yes. And so that's why he made it so simple. In fact, he made it so simple that educated people start to stumble over it and say it's got to be more complicated than that. And religion makes it more complicated. Just like I shared, perhaps had a tinge of religion thinking, yeah, I'm under no condemnation until the next time I mess up. And then I'm back under it again. But that's not what the word says. It says that I've been set free. There's no condemnation that remains. And then we get to verse 4. Here's the purpose of why there is no condemnation. He says, in order that, which is a purpose statement, the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I've kind of already stated the, 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 uh, the, uh, 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 the evident of what is in this verse. But the righteous requirement was met in Jesus that we receive substitutionary into our lives and therefore we have no condemnation. There's things that, that we couldn't do on our own that God did for us. And then he says, I'll give you the ability. I'll give you the ability to live by the law of the spirit rather than the law of human nature that leads you into sin and death. And so it's not our own power that's at work anymore. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us. In other words, we could never get to the place where we could be justified or righteous enough or do enough right things in order to have God accept us. On our side, we could never get to that place. We would always break a law. We would always. And if we broke one, we broke the all. And so God says, you know what? I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to come down and reconcile myself to you because you can never reconcile yourself to me. What an amazing thing he did. Bob Goff is one of my heroes. I don't know if you've read any of his material. He's got a book called Love Does and Everybody Always. And he's an extreme extrovert. I'm not sure if I would like to be around him for a long time. But uh, he's certainly fun to listen to. And he said that he grew up on a street and across the street there was an old woman that was crippled and she couldn't get outside of her house so we got to know her he's just kind of one of those guys that got to know her and found out that she loved parades and she hadn't been to a parade in years but she loved parades and so he got an idea he rallied the whole neighborhood he went and said okay this coming Saturday, we're going to have a parade. And he got the people, the trucks, and the kids, and the candy, and the wagons, and the dogs. He lined them all up. And they had a parade down this certain street. And this lady that was crippled couldn't get out of her house. She's sitting there in her picture window watching the parade. It was all for her. Nobody else. That's a picture of what God did. We couldn't get out of our house. We were crippled. We, were, we, were, we, we wanted something that we couldn't get and couldn't have. And then God says, I'm going to bring it to you. And his name is Jesus. And the parade came to us because we could never produce the parade on our own. Number two, we must participate with the Holy Spirit to yield results. In this life that we live that Paul is outlining for us, we never get to the place where we're totally passive of saying, I'm not engaging even the free gift of righteousness must be believed. That's something you do. You have to decide to believe. Some people say it's totally passive, it's, that, that it's, it's done for you, do nothing. Yeah, that's true. You do nothing, but you have to believe. And therefore, that is something. 
It's a free gift. Yes, it is. But you must believe. And so we must participate in what the Holy Spirit is doing in order to receive the blessing and the benefit. It says in, in verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So a simple question you could ask yourself is, which do I want? Do I want a life that's headed towards death and separation, or do I want a life that's headed towards life and peace? Well, to me, that's a no-brainer. I would certainly desire to have a life that is full of newness and peace. And so Paul is, is saying that it literally gets worked out in the mind. Now, if you go into that verse, you will see that it uh, talks about those that are minded by the flesh, then there will be a result of that, of sin and death. Those that are minded of the Spirit, then they will receive an understanding and begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit. So God comes in here and he begins to, to, to tell us that as we engage together in a Spirit-directed life, that our, mind, our minds must be engaged in this process in order for the outcome to be as we and God want it to be. So I read verse 6. Let me jump back to verse 5. And uh, a thought there have there for you is that we are still given freedom to choose. I've already shared that. Verse 5, again, reiterates that. Paul says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And we understand that in the natural, don't we? That when our minds get set on certain things, we do that. I mean, we're riding down the road, we see ice cream sign, we're like, Arr! we're in, you know, standing in line with a thousand other people. We don't care. Our mind's like fastened on that one thing and we're like, we're in. So we understand that in the natural, but that is also a spiritual principle as well. Just as our mind engages in certain things in the natural, we also will, can engage in the spiritual as well to develop and to have come out of us the fruit of the Spirit. But many times we engage in things that we don't know how it's going to turn out. Most of the time when we stop for ice cream, we know how it's going to turn out. Good, right? <laughs> and it's never enough. But there's things that we enter into that we, we don't know how it's going to turn out. Like getting married. We don't really know how it's going to turn out, right? <laughs> or maybe getting pregnant. We don't know how it's going to turn out. Maybe taking a new job with new people that we never, we don't know how it's going to work out. Or maybe a new church to visit a new church. We don't know how it's going to go when we walk in the doors. Or maybe visiting a small group of people in the church. Oh yeah, I see those people on Sunday morning, but what are they really like in small group? We don't know how it's going to turn out. Or going to your doctor for a yearly checkup. You're not sure how it's going to turn out. But even in all those settings, you can set your mind upon what you believe will go right, or you can set your mind on what you believe will go wrong. Even before you walk into those settings, you can set your mind on, oh, this is going to go wrong. This is not going to be a good day. I know it's going to be horrible. Or you can set your mind as, it's going to be a challenging day, but I believe Jesus is going to win. And he's going to show me how to win. He's going to give me wisdom in these situations to win. It's all where you set your mind. And so Paul's driving this point home that we need to participate in this spirit-directed life. The end result, in verse um, 8, the end result either, is of either choice. He tells us here. He says the mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Now, we have uh, primary drives in our life. We have secondary drives in our life. For instance, uh, I would say a primary drive 
in the body that God gave us, gave us would be uh, air, water, food, work, and rest. They would be primary. And so there's secondary drives that we have, but we have primary drives. Now, you're underwater and you feel like you're drowning, your lungs, you're like, you're like I got to get to the top to suck some air because I'm running out. That's a primary drive. If you've ever been there or felt like you were drowning, you're like, I need air. Um, water or drink. You can go days without food, maybe even weeks or months, but water is incredibly important. It's a primary drive, drink, in order to be nourished. Food. You get on a food drive every three or four hours to the refrigerator. <laughs> You're like, I'm hungry. It's a, it's a drive that we have. And in work, we all created to do something. If we, we sit around and do nothing, we'll just go crazy it, because we were created in this body that God gave us to work, to do something, to make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. That's what we're called to do. And so work is not a bad thing. Work is a, an incredible gift from God. And then as a result of working, we rest. We take time to sleep and recover and, and even dream and, and uh, process that which life is all about. So we have these primary drives. We also have secondary drives in our life. And it's like, what house do you live in? Or what place do you work? Or maybe the transportation you choose to use? Or friends that you have? Or restaurants that you go eat at? Or how many hours of sleep do you sleep and need? And if you're a married couple, how often you have sex? All these things are secondary drives that we have in our lives. And so Paul is saying that when we're powered by the Spirit, whether they're primary or secondary, we actually operate being thoughtful, caring, peaceful, and enjoyable. Amen. That when we're powered by the Spirit, it's a blessing. Even though we have these drives as a human being, it's a blessing that we actually do those in a thoughtful way, a caring way, a loving way, a peaceful way. And then he goes on to say, but if you're powered by the flesh, then it doesn't turn out very well. It's self-centered. It's miserable to those around you and chaos and, 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 and challenge and difficulty. And even though some of you may be in one of those situations now, the good news is that you can walk through or walk out or get free, even if you stay in. God has all kinds of ways for him to work when we're powered and directed by his spirit. And the next point I have is that human nature without engaging, our human nature without engaging with the Holy Spirit. Paul comes back and he says, listen, all this good news I'm bringing to you, now this is what it's like, or this is what's going to happen if you take the Spirit out of your life. In verse uh, 7 and 8, he says this, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Wow. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it. In other words, it's not even capable. Those who are of the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And we don't often like to think of ourselves that way, do we? That we just get outside of the spirit for a little bit because we're angry about something or mad about somebody or, or you know, something goes wrong that we just have a flesh fit for a little bit. We don't think about the fact that in that midst of that, we, we can't please God. We can't, we, we, we're hostile towards God. We're hostile in hearing God. We don't often think of ourselves that way. And yet that's what Paul is saying that happens. And so Paul is, is uh, man, he's going for the juggler vein here of giving us a reality check of what life looks like without being directed by the spirit in our life. Let me just Boil it down to a bottom line, and, and this, is, this is what I've come to. That if you want to drive your life in the flesh, then you will live by sight. You will live by your five senses, and that's it. What they tell you is what you believe, and you live that way. But when you live directed by the Spirit, you will live by faith. Yes. And that means that whatever the situation looks like, 
even though it might be difficult or bad, you say, but I live by faith, therefore God can change, turn it around, change me, change them, change the circumstance. He can turn it around. I choose to live by faith that God can turn it around rather than live by sight that it's, only, that it's really bad and it's only going to get worse. So that's the bottom line. How do you want to live? I choose to live by faith. Number three, putting the Holy Spirit in charge means a complete saturation of our whole being. Com not compartmentalized, like I'm going to come to church and be spiritual, or I'm going to, and then I'll go home and I won't be as spiritual. And then I'll go to work and I'll just, you know, be ugly to my teammates and those there. No, God says, I want a, I want a complete saturation. I want, to, I want to saturate your mind, your emotions. I want to saturate your will. I want to saturate everything a part of you. What you see, what you hear, what you say, what you do. I want to saturate everything. That's what it means to live a spiritual directed life. And we teach us that way. The presence of the Holy Spirit, I thought there I have, the presence of the Holy Spirit is also the presence of Christ. Sometimes we, um, in, in our presentation of the gospel and, and what we talk about, that we sometimes just make Jesus central, and he, he should be in regards to our salvation. And yet we don't realize there's two other people, persons of the Trinity, that are equal God and equally important. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And yet we focus upon Jesus. And I love Jesus. He's amazing. And yet the reality is for us to have a spirit-directed life, we need to recognize there is a Holy Spirit that is working and lives in us. There is a Jesus that models for us what it means to live in this life as a human being and went to the cross to give us victory and set us free. And there is a loving heavenly father that leads us and guides us, even disciplines us in our life because he loves us. Amen. And sometimes we just focus on one and not the other three. In fact, the first person of the Trinity that you met when you got saved was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Jesus. The call was for Jesus, but the person that influenced you first to be drawn to give your life over to Christ or to live with him was Holy Spirit. He's the one that convicts of sin. He's the one that draws us. He's the one that calls us to come. And he was so humble and so silent that you missed him because all he did was like, Jesus, da -da, and you missed the fact that he was even working in your life. But he was. First person you met was Holy Spirit. And he introduced you to Jesus. And as soon as you met Jesus, then if you've read the scripture, again, sometimes it's not taught that way. He goes, da-da, the Father. And he stands in the background. And we come and understand the fullness of God, the Father, and how he walks with us and works with us along the way. And again, this verse is pointing out, let me read it for you, verse 9. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And Paul is relating here that uh, when we get Jesus, the way we receive him is the Holy Spirit coming and living inside of us. And so it's important for us to understand that God comes in the fullness. In fact, he says, uh, all for one and one for all, right? Wait a minute, that's the three musketeers. <laughs> that's also the Holy Spirit. All for one and one for all. That could equally be God's slogan. In fact, I think the three musketeers stole it from the Trinity. Let's put it that way. <laughs> definitely, not the other, definitely not the other way around. The Holy Spirit is living and working in our lives to work out issues and bring us victory. There is um, um, sometimes people um, are brought to Christ with, um, uh, do you know if you're going to, if you die today, will you go to heaven or go to hell? And, you know, sometimes people go, yes, no, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I hope so. 
And of course, then you walk out that, uh, that question. But then sometimes uh, the gospel is printed in a, uh, or presented in another way, like, uh, do you want a new life? I know my friend Dini that was in Albania, he grew up in that atheistic uh, country, and so when it opened up in the 90s, an uh, evangelistic team went there, and he was one of the first in his region to respond, and what he responded to, he said, I could care, I heard him recently say, it wasn't about the heaven or hell issue, he said, I didn't understand that or care about that. He said, I wanted a new life, <laughs> and that's what he responded to. And uh, he received Jesus and was baptized and serving Jesus today. So again, God brings us uh, into following him with, with certain carrots, so to speak. And yet it's important that uh, we get there and understand that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Or the, the Holy Spirit comes to us in, in, in the form of Jesus. It's, it's all one. It's one for all and all for one. The next thought I have that even in the effects of sin and decay we can remain righteous. Even with the effects of sin and decay in this body that we're in, we can remain righteous, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. What does this mean? It means that someone could actually have a incurable disease in this realm, not in God's realm. I don't believe there's anything incurable in God's realm, but in this realm, there's those you go and you say, well, that's incurable or that's untreatable. Well, even though you might have that diagnosis or you might have that condition, that doesn't mean, that doesn't affect your righteousness at all, period. And yet sometimes there's a strain of theology of thinking, Job dealt with that, a strain of theology way back then to say, you must have done something wrong because this happened to you. That's thinking, thinking, that's wrong theology. And Job understood that it didn't affect his righteousness. Rachel opened up the service and says, my Redeemer lives and he will say, I'll stand on that day. So Job got it. And the question is, do we? Again, we have things happen and conditions that come upon us, and yet we begin to think, maybe my righteousness is affected. We have to go back to verse 1 and say, therefore, now, there is no condemnation left for you in Christ Jesus. Drawing from the Spirit's power resurrects dead things to life. I love this. This is, verse 11 has become one of my favorite verses in the last number of months, and I'll share why in a little bit. Let me read it for you. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Wow. Is that powerful or what? Apart from the spirit living in us, just ourselves, could we ever bring somebody back to life? No. no, we don't have the capability. But with the Spirit's power directing our life, we can pray and God will bring people back to life in the same way if we have th our bodies being affected in certain ways. As I get older, I understand that. In fact, I've got an issue with my left eye right now. They say is incurable or even, perhaps even, un, I guess they say it's untreatable. But I'm standing in faith to believe that God is going to bring it back full 2020. It's going to be a testimony for the doctors and for God. And so what I do is I pray this prayer. I'm riding in my car to work. And I'll say, my eyes will get a little blurry. And I'll say, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in me, and therefore you're going to affect my eye right now. Hallelujah. And so I use this verse as a way of receiving God's healing into my body Amen. in ways that man says can't be done. I stand in faith to believe that he's going to do it. He's working. Even if I don't see it, he's working. And I trust to stand that way. So this is a very, very powerful, powerful spirit, or, or, or yeah, powerful spirit too, but uh, powerful uh, verse, that's what I meant to say, powerful verse for us to begin to get a hold of and to live. You know, I liken 
living the spirit-directed life like riding a bicycle uphill. If you've ever ridden a bike uphill, which I'm sure most of you probably have, there could be a few that haven't, that just like the flat surface. But if you've ridden a bike uphill, you recognize that if you would stop pedaling, what would happen? You would go down. Probably crash first, <laughs> and then go backwards, you go down. But you keep pedaling because you know you're going to get to the top of the hill. But if you would stop pedaling, you would go backwards. And that's pretty much the same as a Spirit-directed life. You engage with the Holy Spirit within you to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. But if you would stop pedaling, if you would stop engaging, you would find yourself going backwards. That's right. Now, as I heard that illustration, the Lord began to give me more. And that is that most of us probably learned how to ride a bike on a one speed. That was it. And hills were rough. In fact, we got to the place where we just got off the bike and pushed it because we couldn't make it over. But now we rarely have one speeds anymore. I remember when the three speeds came along. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Right there on the handlebars, you know, click, click, click and get another gear. And every time what happened is that when the hill came harder, I clicked into another gear and my pedaling stayed the same or even got easier. And now, first service, I was thinking there's probably, I knew about 10 speeds. And I thought maybe there's a 15 speed. Somebody said there's a 27 speed. I heard in between services there's a 30 speed. But what's the purpose of all that? The purpose is that when you're going uphill, that you click into another gear, that even though you're going uphill, your pedaling is just as easy as if you were on the flat surface. And the Lord said that's grace in your life. That there is always more than enough grace for whatever you're facing. It's like pedaling that bike, and even though it's uphill and it's rough, but you can put into another gear, and that even though you have a change going uphill, the pedaling is just as easy as if you're on a flat surface, and that's God's grace. It's more than enough. Whatever you're in, or whatever stage you're at, you click into another gear to say, God, give me more grace. That's what I'm doing with my eye. More grace. God, thank you for the grace that is there. Some of you that will walk through tough things, you would understand this. You just say, God, this is rough, but there's more grace that you have. And you click the bike into another gear and you go, wow, this is amazing. But if you try to do a one speed up that hill, if you're going to say, well, God, you just dealt out that measure of grace and it's not enough for this situation, therefore, I guess... I'll just have to get off the bike and push. No. That's not the gospel that Paul's preaching. And I realize that he didn't say that in this context, but he certainly does say it in others. And I want to encourage you this morning that there is enough grace. Just click into another gear. 12 and 13, finishing up. Paul says, uh, or my thought is, just because the flesh presents itself, we have no obligation to give in. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. See, before we were living the Spirit-directed life, what that meant is that when we faced difficulties and challenges, that we approached them just like the world did. Or just like maybe our family upbringing did. Or maybe uh, the counseling that we got from, from somebody that wasn't following the Lord did. And we, we begin to handle those situations in a way in which everybody else did. But suddenly, when we receive Jesus and the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us, and we begin to be Spirit-directed, God shows us different ways to handle the situation than everybody else is. And that's the value and purpose of, of recognizing that when those other ways present themselves, we're not under any obligation to say yes to them, even though they might seem like a good idea. Or maybe we tried it that way before and we found out, well, that doesn't work. 
And we, we, we walk and we walk forward and thinking to ourselves, Matt, how do we do this? And God says, I have the answer. If you ask me, you'll sit with me. About a week and a half ago, the Lord just impressed upon me, wanted me to start journaling again. So I agreed with him. And it's been amazing as I sit down in the mornings and get up early and get a cup of coffee. And before I'd used to go on the news, and find out a little bit the world hadn't blown itself up <laughs> and then come back. God says, you know, you don't really need that stuff. Let's you and I talk. So I open up my iPad and I put the date of the day down and sometimes something's on my mind and I'll ask the Lord, what about this? And he begins to talk to me. He gives me thoughts. I write them down. I'm like, wow, that makes sense. Sometimes I'll ask him, what, what's on his mind? And he'll begin to share with me and I'll write him down. And the other morning, I didn't have anything on my mind and I asked him what was on his mind and he just said, sit with me. Just sit with me. So I did. 15, 20 minutes, just sat with the Lord. That's what it means. I mean, I don't know that I have the fullest picture, but I think that's what it means to live the Spirit-directed life. That we realize that Jesus is not up there distant, unconnected from his body. He's fully engaged through Holy Spirit. And we're the ones that have to decide to connect. And I'm having an amazing time. You know, it's one of those things where you start doing something and after a couple of weeks, then you realize, why wasn't I doing this all my life? <laughs> I don't know about you, but you know, I have those moments just being open and real. And uh, wow, it's been a joy. It's been rich and it's been powerful. But I'm gonna close today and ask you one question. Are, are you in that kind of thought that I was for a long time of, yeah, there's no condemnation until I mess up again? The Lord wants to set you free this morning. If you're in Christ this morning, wants to set you free from that thought that there's no condemnation until you mess up again. He wants to impress upon you and brand you with the thought and the idea and reality that there is no condemnation left ever for those that are in Christ Jesus. For those that are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're here and you realize, I need to engage more with Holy Spirit. I need to participate more. I need to dialogue more. I need to, to be at a place where I have communion more with Him. The Lord is drawing me to that place. I encourage you to step out and do it. Step out and, and just allow the Lord to, to speak to you and direct you. Ask Him questions. He's alive. Ask Him questions. Let Him share with you. If you're puzzled, get the input of one or two other trusted people. The Lord delights in confirming in two or three witnesses what He has in mind. And maybe you're at a hard place in your life and you realize that you've been peddling life with one gear or maybe three. There's a 27 gear bike, maybe even 30, that's available for you. One gear for any given situation is more than enough grace. More than enough grace. Receive it. Walk in it. Know it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chapter of all chapters that we're just beginning in my senses is just going to get richer and better and more powerful and more exciting, Lord. And so today, God, we're just coming and basking in the truths that you've shared with us, Lord. And I pray, Father, for those this morning that have the thought that I'm in no condemnation until I mess up again. Lord, I pray that you would obliterate, send a Holy Spirit missile to that thought and go Pow! it's gone and now there's no condemnation left 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, etch that in their understanding of how complete and how much you love us, Lord. Father, I pray that you would show us where we need to engage, that we've been lax. It's not a, not a religious thing. It's not a controlling thing. It's an invitation. Where we've been relaxed, Lord, show us where we need to engage. And Father, I pray that those that are in a tough time would recognize there's another gear for them on the bike of life. There's another gear for them on the bike of life. And may they find it this hour and this day. In Jesus' name.